to the point where they quoted that a person needs to hear the gospel before he's saved. Well, tonight we're going to look at the second part of that. We looked at the Bible as necessary for knowledge of the gospel. But we're going to look at something that's very important, and actually we're all involved in it now with Bible study, that the Bible is necessary for maintaining spiritual life. I think that's one of the things that I think the 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 church is really not really stressed so much. I mean, we come and we hear serving sermons and and but I think individually we fail to understand that being fed once a week is not good enough. And we need to learn to feed ourselves. We need to learn to read the Bible and not just read the Bible as we would a book but to really dig into the Word of God to understand what it says. Now, I've used the term eisegesis and exegesis a lot, I think, when we've talked about study. And eisegesis is where I have the Bible open, but then I try to make what I hear from the world and what I understand fit the Bible. That's called reading into Scripture, eisegesis. But when you really get into studying the Bible for yourself, we need to use exegesis we need to study what the what the scripture says and bring it out what is the context what do the words what does it mean one of the things i first learned when i was really starting to understand scripture and preaching is that we all like application for the word we like the application how does this meet me but we have to be careful for example when i when i preach what I preach, the implication is the same for everything. If I say, uh, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, that's, that's everything. We need to be born again. But the application, you may be somewhere along in your walk that's a little different. And the application, you would say, well, I don't need this part because I understand that this is the part I need to work on to apply it to my life. So what I try to do is I just try to hit you all with the implications. What does scripture mean? What does, it, what does this scripture mean? And then how it works in you is based on your study and it's based on where your walk is with the Lord. So that's, that's what I try to do. When you study the Bible for yourself, we need to understand that we sit there that we are, we are looking at something very special. And the God who has this Bible, the God who wrote this Bible, knows our heart. So as we begin to study, we need to pray and open ourselves up to the Word of God. Because the Word of God is a living document. It's not something that's dead. It's living. And you know that because if you've read a verse and gone back and read a verse five years from now, you'll say, well, that kind of changed a little bit. It didn't change. It's a living document that changed you. So... The Bible is necessary for maintaining spiritual life. Somebody get Matthew 4.4 4 and read that for us, please. And I need someone to look up Matthew or Deuteronomy 32.47 as well. So whoever has Matthew 4.4, 4, please read. Okay, in that verse, Jesus is indicating to us that our spiritual life is maintained by daily nourishment from the Word of God. You know as well as I do, you miss a day without food, and you are miserable. But we put so much emphasis on that, we forget that our spiritual walk is twice as important as our, our, our natural feeding. So if it is our food, we have to learn to eat it. We have to learn the necessity of it. I, you know, it, it's, and even as you learn and, you, and you're eating from the word of God, you know as well as I do that if you eat, if your daily nourishment is candy, if your daily nourishment is not healthy, you become sick. You don't feel as strong. And if you don't take the time in the word of God, to dig deep and to eat and get the nutrition, your spiritual life will reflect that. 
your spiritual life will reflect that. Okay, and to neglect daily reading of God's word, as I said, is as detrimental to the health of our souls as the neglect of physical food. Uh, whoever has Deuteronomy 32, 47. Thank you. So what does that mean? For it is no empty word for you. The word of God is not empty. It's not just nothing. But it says, but your very life. And by this word, what word? The word of God, you shall live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to possess. The Bible tells us how to live. It feeds us. It gives us that nutrition how to live, what God expects. It tells us everything that God wants us to know where we live. And what do I mean that? When, when the culture is going crazy, when things are going crazy, in order for you to live long and to maintain that spiritual relationship with God, the word of God you've got to feed on daily. It is your strength. The Bible says the Lord is the rock of my salvation. But he can only be the rock of your salvation if you know him. And just to, con it, to confess him and not to read about him, not to learn about him, is dangerous. It's dangerous. And Peter, in 1 Peter 2, 2, writes the following to encourage us. He says, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. Now, conversely, Paul also tells us later, don't just desire milk. You've got to eat meat. I mean, you can go over and read John 3, 16 all you want, and that's great. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. That's, that's good, but that is milk right now. For those of you that are here that have been saved, that's milk. What you need to do is when Paul writes to the churches, when Paul writes to Timothy, explaining the battles that you have inside, explaining how to fight, how to negotiate these things through the word of God, that is the meat. That is building that strong foundation over you so that you can stand in the times of trouble. And that pure spiritual milk, of course, Paul Peter is referring to the word of God. And in 1 Peter 1, 23 20 through 25, he writes this. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the word, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. The Bible is just more than what I think we've looked at in the church. And I think when you look at the spiritual growth of a church, this isn't in my notes, but when you look at the spiritual growth of a church, a church cannot grow if it does actions on its own, what it believes to be right, rather than doing what the Word of God says to do. You know, I'll admit... As a pastor now, I just sometimes my friends say, how it's going? And I say, well, uh, it's going great because I realize I'm not that bright of a pastor. So that means that what I have to do is I have to rely 100% on the word of God. If it's not in the word of God, I'm not doing it. If it's in the word of God, I have to dig in order to be able to present it to you that this church would grow. Have you ever seen a child that is in a home kind of unstable and they're always getting in trouble? But the reason they're getting in trouble is because they're trying to find out what the rules are, what the boundaries. Does anybody care? I used to tell Cindy that in the church, if from here the boundaries aren't established with the word of God, if people don't hear the word of God, there's an insecurity. There is. 
There's an insecurity of what can we do, what can we not do. And actually, without that security, you actually have division in the church. I told Cindy at one time, it's like having our six kids in the house on a rainy day. Why do they fight? Because they don't know what to do. They're not, they can't be kept busy. And the word of God from here, when I teach, it's to give you things to keep you busy. But not busy satisfying yourself apart from the word of God, but learning to grow in the word of God. And to let you know the security that my goal is to keep you safe. Keep you safe because the enemy, Satan, comes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And his purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. And the only thing that can be done to prevent that is the word of God. So we need it to grow. We need it in order for us to be established as a church. We need it in order for us when we come to those times of conflict. It isn't your word against mine. It's the word of God against us. Are we submitting? Are we complying? So it's very much needed for our growth individually and corporately as a church. And here's the other. The Bible is necessary for certain knowledge of God's will. If I were to ask you, can you any, just throw out, what are some of, some of, from what you read in Scripture, what is God's will for us that you read? Because he states a lot. What are some of it? Okay, his will is to enjoy the gospel. God's will too is what? That none should perish but all have everlasting life. Right? That we love, we love our neighbor, we love him. Okay. Share his word. Yeah. Care for the saints. Huh? Care for the saints. Care for the saints. So we know the little parts, the, the little things that make up God's will. And that's good because later I'll discuss this, that all people ever born have some knowledge of God's will through their conscience. And what I mean by that, just to throw, we know that we could say it's God's will, but if you're not a believer, that, that it's wrong to lie. That it's wrong to steal. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to, uh, I learned this before I was even a Christian, I didn't even know a scripture. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We know some of these things just by what we've been taught. And those that have never been in church have probably heard these things. Are you going to say something? Oh, no. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, Romans sort of talks about, you know, there's, there's that, you know, God has put his law in our hearts. They were without excuse. Here's an interesting statement that the, the author wrote in his teaching here. If there were no written word of God, we could not gain certainty about God's will through other means such as conscience, advice from others, an internal witness of the Holy Spirit, changed circumstance, and the use of sanctified reasoning and common sense. We would be flying off the hip. Some of the things would be okay, but there would be no standard. No sub and these might all give an approximation of God's will in more or less reliable ways but just from these means alone, no certainty apart from the word of God, uh, no certainty about God's will could ever be attained, at least not in a fallen world where sin distorts our perception. Now, there's some things we need to know about why the scripture and why being born again is important for this. People have always said, you know, trust your heart. And we really can't trust our heart. Do you know why? Right. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitfully, is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? That's why sometimes when you say, well, just follow your heart. Sometimes you follow your heart to destruction. And when you think about it, when you want to get a true measure of one's heart apart from Christ and even 
being born again, we deal with that carnality, that sin that's of our desires that kind of comes up and interferes with it. If you remember when Noah and his family came off the ark, they were on dry land and he built an altar. And God said, I will not destroy the, the world with water again. But then he said, but man's heart is still deceitfully wicked from his youth. And that's for us to measure. That's why it's when you say, I, I give you my heart. You have to be careful with what you say. I've seen a lot of relationships where people have said, well, I entrusted him with my heart only to find out that there's been skullduggery behind and people have been hurt because the heart that was received was deceitfully wicked and had no real intensity towards that person. And that's what we have to as we study the word of God. As we cleanse ourselves with the word of God, it cleanses our heart. We really realize where we are, how we have to study, where we need to go, and we trust the Holy Spirit to clean us. Hebrews 5.14 tells us, Solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So the new Christian that needs the milk, they need to be taught through the scripture in order to become mature. Discernment is one of the things that's really kind of lacking today in a lot of the churches. And I say that because there's a lot of things that are coming into the, sermon, into the churches that are not from God. You look at a lot of cultural things. Discernment would tell you you can't put that in there if you recognize it for the evil that it is. But if you don't study the Word of God to really understand God's goodness and God's idea of good versus us, then you will welcome things that sound good. That's why you... Go ahead. Yeah, like counterfeit money. Right. That's exactly right. So we see that apart from the Bible, that would be the delusions that we would fight. We would see so much and without discernment, we wouldn't have an idea. But the word of God in scripture, we do have a clear and definite statement about God's will. It's ironic that Deuteronomy 29, 29, 29 says to this, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. I want to read it again. I just ask for your input. What, what is this saying? The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the works of this law. What is this, what is this passage of Scripture telling us? Okay, basically it's this. Everything God wants you to know about him is in this book. But that's not all about God. And that's important for another reason. Remember I told you before, make sure you have, you grow in milk before you get in meat. If you look outside of, and you can look at televangelism, you can look at some of this. You can see where there are some secret things the Bible doesn't tell us that people make up. Or they write books to, make, to fill in those gaps. You hear things how, well, the Lord talked to me yesterday and I went to heaven and he showed me X, Y, and Z. They're trying to answer mysteries that God has never intended for us to know. And man in his curiosity has a tendency to go after the things he doesn't know, the mysteries to solve a riddle rather than spend the time going into what he should know and grow. And if you look at that, again, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, period. Interpretation, quit worrying about it. 
They belong to him. He doesn't want you to know. The things he wants you to know is basically his plans of redemptive history. Your creation, the fall, his son, redemption, heaven. That is the purpose. That is the purpose. It's God revealing himself through, the, uh, through his redemptive process. And he says because of that, all those things are revealed and they belong to us and our, for, our children forever that we may do all the words of the law. So you're not required to do what you don't know that's a mystery. But you are required to not go after the mystery, but go after what he said for you to do. Read the word and do those things that have been revealed. He also tells us what's another blessing of the Lord that we have about God's will. Blessed are those whose way is blameless. How can you be blameless? Those who walk in the law of the Lord. You notice it uses the word blameless because there's no innocent people. All of us have fallen. We've been redeemed. We can, we can be blameless in an event. If, you're, uh, if, if somebody has a car accident, you're driving and somebody hits you, you're involved in that incident, but you are blameless. It happened to you. It happened to you. Also, he says, God's will, Psalms 1, 1, and 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. In other words, those who stay away from evil. We need to remember that God's will for us is to come out and be separate from the world. We cannot indulge in the pleasures of the wicked world. There are things we can do, but there are things we cannot do. We talked about being unequally yoked. Can't be unequally yoked. Why? And this is something even in marriage. You can't be unequally yoked. If one's an unbeliever, one's a believer, they shouldn't marry. Why? Because light cannot dwell with darkness. And then you have a conflict. You have one person who's following the way of the word, and you have the other following the way of the world, and you can see the conflict. So whose walk is blameless? You don't sit in the, in the seat of the scoffers. You don't, make, you don't mock God's law. But your delight is in the law of the Lord, and on the law he meditates day and night. Again, you get that word that's studying, meditating, chewing on the word. And then 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. And we don't know what that is if we don't study. That's why the word of God is necessary. We need to grow in our knowledge, fear and knowledge of the Lord. Actually, in fact, in one sense, it can be argued that the Bible is necessary for certain knowledge about anything. For example, a philosopher might argue the following. The fact that we do not know everything requires us to be uncertain about everything we claim to know. This is because some fact unknown to us may turn out to prove that we thought to be true was actually false. In other words, we think we know our date of birth, our age, etc. But we must admit it is possible that someday we could find that our parents had given us false information. It's different knowledge. Regarding events that we have personally experienced, we all realize how it is possible for us to remember words or events incorrectly and find ourselves later corrected by more accurate information. I know I, I, I told Cindy one of the things that really shocked me, I did my DNA looking for my family. And I found out that my cousins were not my first cousins, they were my second cousins because I had a different grandfather. I didn't know that. All this time, till I'm 64 years old, I had a certain shot of information only to find out that that information was wrong. We can usually be more certain about the events of our present experience as long as it remains present. At any rate, when you look at that philosopher, it's actually difficult to answer his question. You see, if we do not know all the facts in the universe, past, present, and future, how can we ever attain certainty that we have correct information about one fact? We have to be all-knowing. 
Ultimately, there's only two possible solutions to this problem. One of them is a lot of work. We must learn all the facts of the universe in order to be sure that no subsequently discovered fact will prove our present ideas to be false. Let me give you an example. We do this in street preaching. If someone says that he is an atheist and there is no God, that has to be the smartest man in the world. That's like me saying there is no gold in China. What would it take for me to prove that there is no gold in China? I'd have to check the soil. I'd have to check furniture, check people's teeth, check people's crayons. If I'm going to make an absolute statement like that, that means I have to have all knowledge. It means I have to have everything. And the ironic thing is, if you say there is none, no gold, and you have that absolute, absolute knowledge, then in fact, you become all-knowing and you become God, the very thing you say you disbelieve. So if I'm going to say an absolute, I need to be able to back up the facts. I can say this absolutely. The wages of sin is death. That's an absolute. I can back it up because that's what the Word of God says. If I said something like George is going to win the national title next year in football, that would be a little sketchy. I couldn't absolutely prove that. But I can say the wages of sin is death. That is an absolute. The second solution to that problem is the fact that we have, when we have God's word in scripture, God knows all things. God is omnipotent, he's omnipresent, and he's omniscient. He is omniscient, that is all-knowing and has absolute certain knowledge. There can never be any fact that he does not already know. Therefore, there can never be any fact that would prove that something God thinks is actually false. When you think of this, and even when we talk about studying the Bible, it's amazing if you ever just stop to think about God and his attribute of omniscience. Do you realize he knows every thought in your head before you think it? He knows every word you're going to say before you say it. And he knows every motive of your heart before you do. I heard it best. I was listening to Ray Comfort the other day when I was doing my studies. I like to listen on occasion. And he was talking about right before he became a young believer who was with a young lady and he was out on the beach and he had some ideas and she looked at him and says i want you to know one thing he goes what's that she said god is watching have you ever thought about that when you're where you shouldn't be god is watching and worse god is not only watching but God is knowing what your intentions are. So when we study the word, those quality, those characteristics of God become more real to us. And it helps us as we grow in our dealing with people. It helps us as we grow in our handling of circumstances that maybe somebody in the church will never see us have to deal with. It creates that relationship where in the military, I, I, I liked it. When I was to Officer Canada School, there was a, uh, a saying that we had on the honor code. An honor officer does not lie, cheat, nor steal, nor tolerate anyone else who does. In other words, if you and I were in class together and I saw you cheating, I had to turn you in. Because if I didn't turn you in, we both got kicked out. And imagine God's standard, as you study his word, and you begin to see things in your own life that God wishes to change through that process of sanctification. You see, in that time of relationship, in that time of prayer and study, you can't hide from him any more than you could away from it. But during that time, you can't hide to him the things that you are dealing with. Yeah, go ahead. Hebrews 
two-edged sword and piercing as far as a division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, like you were saying. And then it says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Right. It's like you're studying with God, but as you're studying with God to dig into His Word, the microscope of the Holy Spirit's on your heart, so that as you dig in the Word, the Holy Spirit can bring out from you those things that need to change. When you have studied, what are some of the things that you've realized, not about yourself, I don't need to know that, but have you noticed a closeness with the Lord when you spend time studying have you ever been there where you've read a verse and you were really seeking him and it's just like the whole place gets a little heavy? That there's a presence there. You know, I used to tell my Pentecostal friends, they used to get all excited when the Holy Spirit would move and they would do all their things. And I said, realistically, from Scripture, it tells me that when the Holy Spirit moves, when God comes in, there's not a lot of movement. I said, the sinner flees. Or dies and the saint just sits the presence of God is so peaceful it's so strong it's just like love coming inside of you as you study his word there's a special feeling at that time I wish I had it more than I have but that reflects on my lack of digging at time when you read the Word of God to grow, when you decide you want to study, to get in that relationship with Him, I think if we would just take it as God having written you a personal letter, and what He's writing in that letter to you is His heart and His desire for you. And what we see as we study the Word of God from our sinfulness and our thing are the things that He wishes for us that we're lacking. Yet when we read that Word of God and we study, we get from Him the Spirit that allows us to grow, that allows us to get closer to Him. I have a friend now that is going through a lot. And the situation that he's in has caused him to go into the Word of God. And he told me, I really didn't, don't like this. He said, the more I get into the Word of God, the more I see myself for who I am. And I said, but if you read the Word of God, you're going to see something that's very important that should be encouraging for all of us as we study. The closer you get to holiness, the more sinful you feel. And we're going to feel that way until the day we die and the sin is removed. Because when that which is sinful and not perfect comes into that presence, there's a feeling like, I shouldn't be here. Lord, I am unworthy. It's like Peter on the boat. Lord, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. He saw the works of God. He said, depart from me. But I told my friend, I said, when you have your head down and you're really thinking, I shouldn't be here, I want you to look up. Now, this is me. When I struggle like that and I look up, I keep seeing in my mind, looking at myself, my past, as I walk forward, I, I look forward and it's almost like I can see Jesus with his hand out saying, it's painful, but I want you to come closer. I want you to come closer. I want you to be close to me. And that's where we have to die to ourselves and that's what we have to press on and we cannot do that unless we dig into the word knowing that this word is necessary for us to have that close relationship with God. The closer you get to God as you study, the more you're going to see things in yourself from your carnal that you're not going to like. That's why it's important you understand that process of sanctification. That process of sanctification is God showing you through his word, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that in you that needs to change. Why? Because you're being conformed to the image of his son who was perfect righteousness. And we have the hope knowing that we are not going to be perfect because we have that sin still in our heart. But we keep striving. We keep walking through our study of the word until that day we die. 
And that last vestige of sin is washed away from our hearts. And we step into glory and we see him face to face. That's our progression. Each and every one of us are like the children of Israel on that 40-year journey. We're going through. How am I going to be fed? This is uncomfortable. Where are you, God? And through those, we'll get little snippets, the little miracles, the little things. But we press forward knowing that at the end of that journey, it's not Canaan. It's heaven we're going to. But you don't understand that without reading the Bible. You don't understand that if you don't see how necessary Scripture is. You'll live your everyday life by saying, okay, let's see, I'll read Psalms 1. Yep, that's good, I'm done for the day. That, that doesn't work. That's just like you eating Pop-Tarts every day. It's not going to be good for you. Physically, you'll get sick. And if all you do is look at the Bible for five minutes, two minutes, and that is your full time of your study, you're going to miss out. You'll never go from milk to meat. That's why the scripture is necessary. It's from the infinite storehouse of certain knowledge that God who never lies has spoken to us in scripture in which he has told us many true things about himself, about ourselves, and about the universe he has made. Therefore, it's appropriate for us to be more certain about the truths we read in scripture than any other knowledge we have. I think for me, when I read Romans, because I've, we've been doing it, that now in conversation, when people tell me, well, I think this or I think that, my first response is like, Paul, well, what does scripture say? I want to know what scripture says. And it's true. And I will even tell you for political arguments, just a little on this side. When you hear somebody talking about everything in the world, how bad it is, and what's going on, ask them, well, what does Scripture say? Because if a person studies the Bible and they look at the world as it is and all this thing, they're going to say, well, Scripture tells us that Jesus said this was going to happen. Well, if the Scripture says this is going to happen, then why are you surprised? Now, the real question is, Scripture says this is going to happen... How does it say you are to respond? See, the Bible tells us how to respond. Do we jump in with the world and try to fix it? Or do we understand at that point that God has started a process here? It's called judgment. And all of a sudden, our priority should be not to fix the world. It's to reach the lost. Those who are going to perish. You see, apart from Scripture... And the knowledge of what scripture says, we try and we tend to try to fix things and we miss the big picture. What is the big picture now? We have in the world, right? We have chaos. We have liberalism. Let me ask you, is that as bad as it's going to get? How's it going to get worse? Yeah, we also say there's going to be famines, there's going to be earthquakes, there's going to be wars, there's going to be rumors of wars, right? And even within your home household, because there will be those who aren't believers that are, again, that are going to call you uh, intolerant, bigoted, all those things. We call that persecution. That's coming. But you know what? That is not still as bad as it's going to get, because there's going to be a point in history or in the future, when somebody's going to rise to power, and he's going to do worse to the church than what we've had done. So if you look at the picture, by studying the Word of God, understanding the necessity of studying the Word, when you look at it, you can actually say, you know, things are bad right now, but they're really not as bad as they're going to get. It changes your whole perspective. I mean, when you think about it, when you think about, even if you look at the tribulation, if you look at those things, how things are going to be really, really, really bad before we leave. As a matter of fact, for some, the blessing will be that they will go to be with the Lord before it really, really gets bad. But today we look. We're surprised with COVID. Really? Famines, plagues, wars, rumors of wars. It's in scripture. 
I mean, that's when we have a Bible study on Saturday and I listen to this and that's the only thing I ask them. What does scripture say? Tell me that the scripture has not told us these things in advance. And if so, why are we surprised? And I'll answer why we're surprised. Because we don't study scripture. We don't read scripture. God, in his book, tells us what's happening. And he even gives us a futuristic glance at it. But for us, as believers, our purpose is not to be anxious and worry. Because we're not of this world anyway. But scripture tells us what we need to do is we need to share the gospel. We need to stand. We need to be salt. We need to be light. I don't know if you look in Revelation, but one of the things that it says about those not here inheriting the kingdom of God, I, I challenge you to look at it. And, if, and that one first word they use is a coward. Cowards will not inherit the kingdom of God. What does that tell us? You're going to be born again. You're not going to get out of the kingdom of God. You're going to be saved. But for us, we cannot afford to be a coward. We need to stand. But you won't know how to stand. And you won't be able to know the signs of the times unless you study the word of God. And on the other light, too, that's how you improve your marriages. That's how you improve your relationships. Men are spiritual leaders of their home. Scripture tells us as spiritual leaders of the home that we are to lead our families. We are to read to them. We are to love God through them so that our love is not dependent on condition, but unconditional love that God shares with us. And that's a process of growing through as well. So it tells us how to be with our family. It tells us how to relate with our children. It tells children how to relate with the parents. It tells dads not to frustrate their children and cause, them, cause frustration from saying, do as I say, not as I do. The Bible tells us as a church to take care of widows and orphans. The Bible tells us how to do that. As a matter of fact, there's two offices in the church. We call we have deacons, but the Bible talks about elders and deacons. Elders are, elders are the overseers. Those, for example, at Crawford, I would be called the preaching elder because that's what I do. You have elders that teach, and then you have deacons that assist the elders. And that's in the book of Acts. If you remember, there was a time when the people, the, um, the Greek, or I'll think about who they are now. But the apostles were approached because one of the group of Christians said that their widows and orphans were not being given their fair share. And the apostles said, it's not good that we wait on tables. Not that there's anything wrong with wait on tables. But we're going to choose men for ourselves to take care of that so that we focus on the preaching and the teaching of the word. So even the church is set up to fix and to help take care of those in the church. But unless we study the word of God, we wouldn't know that. So it's important that we, as a church and individually in your home, focus everything around the word of God. What are some of the things that, before we go on about God's existence, because I think it's important, what are some of the things that, Maybe you have seen going on that maybe you've gone to the Bible yourself and seen that God has actually said these things were going to occur. What are some of the things that you have dealt with? Could be in a family. I'll give mine then first. We have a daughter right now who is not follow, who never followed the Lord. and she, Actually, she's in jail right now. And it's been hard because there has to be uh, a guidance for us as parents through the word of God, how we handle this situation, that we don't go out of our way to deliver her from her consequences. But rather that we pray, we do what we can and we trust God for her salvation and not and, and pray that those circumstances will be used to bring her to salvation. 
Otherwise, if we were not believers, we would probably go get her out of jail and do all the things that we could to make her life easier, when in fact making her life easier would be probably putting her back in jail at a later time. But the scripture tells us how to deal with our children, especially those that are not believers. Go ahead. Yeah. I think um, what, I, what stood out to me the most, especially in the world, is the calling of evil good and calling of good and evil. The things that God has said, I mean, that's always been there, but it's, it's absolutely in God's face now. It's, there's, no, there's no discussion of it. There's no, well, God says that's wrong. It's very much God doesn't know what he's talking about. If it's if if we want it to be this way, it will be this way. Usurping his authority and calling evil good in the name. We heard something at that class or at one of the sessions. And it had to do with <clears throat> excuse me. Some churches, some pastors supporting abortion. And this was their logic about supporting abortion, death in the womb. They say, we have old people out on the street that are dying all the time. We have hungry on the street, the poor that are dying. Death is imminent, so what is the difference between that death and death in the womb? That is the logic. And we look at abortion, and it's not an issue of pro-life and pro-choice. The real question of abortion, if you read scripture, is this. Does God condone murder? Does God condone murder? And the answer is no. And the fact that scripture, and those that support abortion will not go into this, scripture tells us that in the womb, that child was known by God. Exactly. So you see scripture, when you look at it, you can say, how can anybody support abortion? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. But where, where did that start? Yeah. No, well, well, you know, in the 60s, I remember growing up and hearing adults say, you can't legislate morality. And they're true because you can't live a moral life anyway. But what they did rather than legislate morality is they legalized immorality. Okay? Every, it, it's okay. And now today... We don't know how to determine what immoral act is really immoral. I mean, you look at it. You have a, a, a person in one of the second highest offices in the land now that was just appointed that's transgender. He's dressed as a she. And we are to say that is okay. It's not okay. You took something that the law said in regards to hiring, regarding your ethnicity, regarding your, your, your status, male or female ethnicity, to include now transgender, to include now whatever else, LGBTQA. You, you have things that the world is telling us is okay, and churches some churches are saying okay. And the only thing that's going to separate us from those churches is a belief of value and adherence to the word of God. That's why it's important to study the Bible. I mean, I look at the news with some of this stuff and, and if, I had, if I had not read the Bible, understood what was going on, I, I'd not only be laughing at some, but I'd be just really paranoid. You know, what in the world are they thinking? They're thinking according to the world. But this is not new, see? I can, and, and we're talking about the Word of God here, and I got a couple minutes. 
If you go back to the 1950s, and unfortunately when Billy Graham started his crusades, the thing that Billy Graham did that helped us get to where we are today is on those boards that he had planning his, his revivals, some were atheists, some were Catholics, some were of non-denomination, and what they did is they had to, he allowed them to impart their information so that he could do his crusades. And there was a gentleman named John Stott, who is a very prolific theologian, who in the 60s made sure that people understood that although we were working together, the gospel was not a social entity, it was salvation. Well, you go up 10 years and he changes his mind. He says, no, the gospel now is about dealing with oppression, impover uh, impoverished nations, they call that liberation theology. So what has happened from the 50s is the whole war up till our social justice that we have today is asking one question. What is a Christian? Because in order to get along, they came up with an idea of what everybody could agree on, and that was this. Anybody that was baptized as a Christian, what does Scripture say? It doesn't say that. So our social justice today you hear that if you do not embrace the woke movement, if you don't worry about the social ills, ills, and you don't do anything about the social ills, then you cannot be a Christian. Totally contrary from the word of God. And on this new introduction, what's the Baptist, Southern Baptist Convention adopted last year, critical race theory. Critical race theory says this. That the Bible is good, but we need cultural information. I need to know the background of the people, where they came from, in order that I can understand the Bible better. And that's not how scripture works. That's eisegesis. For example, where I came from growing up was totally different than you. My grandfather was an immigrant. My mom, 15 when I was born. I was raised in a Mexican household. The critical race theory and intersectionality says this, you cannot tell me anything because you don't know where I came from and you don't, and if you wanna understand me more from the Bible, you gotta get the little nuances of my life to make it out. And that's not true. The Bible speaks to every culture. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Talking about interpreting the Bible through different lenses. Through different lenses. And it's even got to the point now, and we are very fortunate being in a small town, but it, it'll come. The fact that those who were born white have already have a problem. Because being white, you don't understand anything about a minority. And this is what they say too. If I invited you to dinner and we had Mexican food and you came to my house, they look at that as you virtue signaling, you wanting to get to know more about me, but you're not capable of doing it. And the whole concept of critical race theory and sexuality is basically there is no forgiveness because you can never make up for that. To the world, that sounds great. To the oppressed, that sounds great in regards to the social world, but the Bible tells us different. And if you uphold the Bible, if you stand by the Bible, it's this big entity that's going to be coming at us. Okay? So that's why we need to know the scripture. Um, if any of you want, I have a link I can send to you. It's called By What Standard? And you can actually see the Southern Baptist Convention when the fight happened on critical race theory. See uh, uh, resolution number nine. And the sad thing was that resolution number nine was presented by a young pastor in California to prevent critical race theory. And what happened is they took it behind curtain and the people of powers would be rewrote it 
And then they introduced it and it passed. So now critical race theory is a tool to use with the Bible in order for you to have a better understanding of other people. Interpret it. And that's all contrary. The Bible says all have sinned. All people are totally depraved. They need a savior. They're deci- they're, the way they say you, you reconcile with the world is you capitulate and you give them what they need. The Bible says if you want to be reconciled, you need to reconcile with Jesus Christ. And then if you're reconciled with Jesus Christ, then you reconcile with all within the body of Christ. So it's important that you read the Bible. It's important that you study. Now, some of the things I just said might irritate you and say, I can't believe it. Well, I will tell you, your response according to the Bible is wrong. Because Jesus said it was going to happen. Love those who hate you. Bless those who persecute you. You see how this is coming to fruition to all of us. So as you study your Bible, it is necessary for you to know how to grow and to walk in the ways of the Lord. It's also a way to keep you up to date. It's better than Fox News. It's better than CNN. It's better than anything you're going to get on society because this is what God says. Man fell. I'm restoring. But there's still a judgment And after that judgment, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. I'm going to destroy what I created, not with flood, but with fire this time. I'm going to destroy it. But my children will not be destroyed. And then I will bring them a new place to live. That's kind of a a synopsis. But if we understand that, then we're not caught off guard when we see men that we used to renown that are starting to say, hey, look, if. You really need to support this critical race theory. Or if our, if, our, if our interest is in organizations that may go away from Scripture. You know, I, I told the men on, on uh, we started Bible study. I love John MacArthur. I love his stance on the Word of God, what he stands for. But if Dr. MacArthur went off in the woods, away from Scripture, I wouldn't follow him off in the woods. Because I follow Scripture. And that's where we need, huh? I'm sorry. Go ahead. And Paul says several times in Scripture when he's speaking to the, the bearers of his epistles in these churches, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. In right. In other words, when, when what I say lines up with, I mean, they didn't have the New Testament then, but if what I, said, if what I say lines up with what God says, follow that, follow me. Right. But do not follow me if I go off on my own. Right. Only as far as I follow Christ. Right. So it's imperative that we study the Word of God for our sustenance, for our spiritual health, but also to deal with the circumstances and the things that are going to come our way. I guess with that we will close. It's time. But I want to encourage you. Um, I said this morning there's a gentleman, Justin Peters, that I would encourage you to follow in regards for discernment with the uh, charismatic uh, craziness that goes out there. There's another gentleman, James White, Alpha and Omega Ministries. He deals with the issues from a scriptural perspective. He's a very well-known teacher. Yeah, James White is good. And, of course, I I listen, uh, the other gentleman I listen to, and I I really enjoy these people uh, from their position because they're black and they're informed and they're scriptural. One of them is uh, uh, Virgil Walker and Daryl Harrison, the Just Thinking podcast. Um, they, They have been ostracized because of their stance for scripture on both sides of the table. And then, of course, Vody Bauckham, uh, another man who lives in Africa right now and he comes back and he preaches but he is very solid and he deals with ethnic issues and basically debunks them and show them uh, shows by scripture where they're wrong uh, these are the gentlemen I'm following and of course R.C. Sproul's passed away but we follow R.C. Sproul as well we follow those who have a that, whose history has focused on the word of God the holiness of God and the character of God and what God expects from us. Uh, 
those those are the standards that 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 I'm trying to to seek after and 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 read and study. And I encourage you to look at some of these gentlemen and uh, and grow. They they will challenge you with the word. There is um, there is nothing in there that's opinion. They will take you to the word. And I will tell you that James White is one who. Not only is he good at what he does, but he debates on various different issues of the church as well as he debates Muslims and he debates others on who Christ is. And uh, it's, it's interesting to see. He's an apologist. Yes, yes, very much so. And then for, if you want something to watch on just basic evangelism and, sal and, and overcoming your fear, then I encourage you to go look at Living Waters and uh, Ray Comfort and crew. Uh, huh? Well, well, Cindy, Cindy and I've had the opportunity. We actually went out on the street with him and Kirk Cameron and uh, our, and Todd Friel. Uh, but these are the people that I would encourage you watching a little bit so that you can stay up to date with what's going on from outside the church coming in because you won't get that from CNN. And for us, we need to... We need to be ready as an army, not only to make sure that we defend what's ours, but that we're able to offensively go out and share the gospel. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you. I ask for a safe journey home for all that are here. And Lord God, we just ask you to keep working in our lives. Draw us closer to you. Give us a hunger for your word. In Christ's name, amen. falling